Hi, everyone. I think I said a hi already to everyone, unless people are still getting on. Heather, I'm so excited to, to see your exhibit, but I thought before we started if um, that I would introduce everyone to, to Barbara Richter, the director of Green Hill, where your exhibit is, and was hoping that, Barbara, you would just tell us a little bit about Green Hill and also what um, drew you to Heather's work. And then we go from there. Did I lose her? Oh, we can't hear you, Barbara. Joys of technology. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Lizzie. Thanks for this wonderful opportunity and, and for sharing um, this really unique exhibition. Um, I'm joined also today by our curator, um, Edie Carpenter, who is also on this call. Um, you know, it's I'm, I'm relatively new to North Carolina, but I will say that um, uh, one of the first people that I I've met in the art world is Lizzie, <laughs> and and her first introduction was to Heather, <laughs> and um, so and here we are, and and um, I was so thrilled to see that Heather had a long and rich, and rewarding relationship um, to Green Hill Center for North Carolina Art, um, and. We are, you know, truly a gateway to the visual arts community in our state. We elevate and celebrate the visual arts. We create and connect opportunities um, uh, for artists, creating visibility and, and mentoring um, and growth. And um, so we're just so, so thrilled um, to be able to uh, participate in Heather's amazing journey. Um, and it's such a timely exhibition and, and in a way, you know, it really um, maps our collective path, you know, from a place of, of anxious isolation um, during the pandemic to this place of resilience and hope um, where we have all arrived. And, um, and Heather's exhibition really um, was, a, came at a time when we all were reimagining um, what visitor engagement means um, and when we were set socially distanced and, um, you know, what this whole conversation about the pandemic um, means for experiencing art. Uh, so we're just absolutely thrilled. Um, and you'll see that, that, um, that Heather has really created these visual pathways that create, con you know, contemplation and rouse curiosity and, um, and the messaging is, is uh, so, so timely and, and inspiring. And uh, we're very excited to share it with all of you today. Barbara, thank you. I, um, I enjoyed reading um, the interview that Heather did a little while ago for y'all's newsletter and found it so interesting that, you know, it, and not at all surprising that y'all do such important work when she said that, you know, an event that she did at Green Hill that she went to about 10 years ago was one of the most important um, connecting events that she'd ever done as an artist. So I, I love that 10 years later, she has a you know big exhibit yeah. with y'all. It's really right. special. To touch at these different different points of, of, of her career. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, everyone, I, I was chatting with Heather earlier today and you know, Heather and I um, are, are dear friends and we kind of like to ramble on and, and just chat about everything. And so we wanted to have this be really informal. So feel free to interject at any point as Heather's walking through, uh, just to ask her questions and to give your feedback or anything. And Heather, is there anything else you need from me at this point or you wanna just take it away? Oh, I'll just kind of take it away. I do kind of ramble. So make sure <laughs> you uh, you say to move on if I get stuck somewhere. I do I get promise. stuck in place. I yeah. promise. Okay. <laughs> I thought we'd start with the drawing stuff because, uh, um, oh, please also know that I can't see anyone. I'm having the camera on me, so I can't see anyone's faces. So don't think that if you hold a hand up that that will do. You'll have to actually say something. Okay, um, so we're here in the drawing section of the show. This is a big space. So at first I was told it was 4,000 square feet and it ends up that it's five, which is pretty big. and. Um, was it kind of the daunting 
task uh, up front, to how to make all of this art to, to fill this space. So this area of the gallery has all of the drawings in it. And these were the very first works I started doing um, right at the very beginning of COVID where I'm looking specifically at language that we hear in the news a lot. So um, this one you're seeing here is called Unprecedented. And there was a painting that was done for this one as well, uh, Unprecedented. But that one, that one uh, sold very early on, even while the pandemic was happening, I was very pleased. And then these others here, so it's not included in the show, but this one here, Happy Talk, um, this one has several different permutations in the show. Uh, there's a, there are two other paintings by this title. This one here is called Toxic. And then the last one here on the wall is called Essential Worker. And how I'm doing this is, is I make origami folding patterns and I make them um, based on the data that I'm trying to express. So everything in my world has to get um, converted into number values and they, and they have to be discrete number values. I like whole numbers myself. And uh, so all of the, the letters in these titles are converted into ASCII values. And I take those, those decimal equivalents and put them into a program that allows me to create origami folding patterns. And then those folding patterns are essentially like structured drawings. And then I can use those to create drawings like this, where I might work on a light table, I might make large paintings um, and full on tape installations, which I'm gonna show you in the show. And I'd like to show you a couple of other things in this area, which are Heather, things that are related to, what was before that? Before we um, leave the drawings, can I, can I move you back towards uh, Torpor? Yes, ma'am. You? Um, back to Torpor. So, yeah. so that was a piece that you um, had been working on and made, you know, prior to the pandemic and the exhibit. And yeah. yet it feels so fitting to kind of what we've all been through, you know, in some ways. Um, will you talk about the meaning behind, you know, behind that, that word and just a little more about that piece? Yes. Um, torpor, spelled T-O-R-P-O-R. -O -O it's kind of a good looking word as well. Um, it is a, a word I'm using to describe the freezing state that happens after a traumatic event, um, I, I, which I had experienced in my life prior to COVID and was dealing with. So what I was finding was that I had kind of my foot on the accelerator and my foot on the gas, mm -hmm. which just creates all kinds of anxiety and this sort of immobility. And I um, couldn't really do a whole lot, but I did, I was able to do this drawing, which uh, funny enough, took almost six times as long to complete as the same size drawing over here. This structure for Sisyphean stone, I did really quickly. And then yet torpor took months and months to complete. And it's a much less complicated drawing. And because I was so frozen, I think. And this is the first time I'm also seeing, I'm making note of this now, there's metallic gold in this, which you can see from, a, from an angle with the way the light shines on it. So there's this sort of value, I think I was thinking of that metallic gold, mm. uh, which you'll also see in the show, um, that persists somehow, that there's a hidden value in something, or perhaps a fool's gold. Um, <laughs> not quite sure. And also the coloration of this is uh, a lot of purple under colors and tones that relate to some, uh, a kind of bruising a mental or spiritual bruising, mm. um, which is temporary and goes away. And I was just reminding myself of it and just kind of using the colors. I mean, bruises are actually quite beautiful. I don't want to hide my vulnerability or my, um, or my trauma, you know? So you earn those, you earn those battle scars, you know, when you recover. So true. Yeah. Um, given that, that we just talked about that, let's go over here and talk about this other one. So this is another painting that was done prior to the pandemic. And it's called 
I have to always refer to it. It happens sometime between the flowering of the lotus and the water lily. And this is this idea is uh, I read an article about the fossil record and how all over the world you can see this one inch of white substance all in the fossil record. And that was the day that all the, that the asteroid hit and the dinosaurs died. And the only reason they can figure out when exactly it happened is because they can look at the pollen that's in that that's in that record. So they know that from the pollen, it was in between the flowering of the, what was it? The lotus and the water lily. And I was thinking about trauma and recovery and how I often would sit with this idea, like, when is it going to be over? When is I'm, when am I going to just get up and be like normal Heather? When am I just going to go about my day without this upset in the back of my mind nagging me? And it occurred to me that one day I would just simply wake up and it would, and I would notice that it was gone and I wouldn't really have a very pinpoint moment, but it would be, be, be determined more, more loose, loosely based, like, like these pollen records, like maybe there's under, other indications in my life that narrow it down. And that sometimes it's okay to not have the specificity of data. Sometimes it's okay to just have a basic guess and, and feel confident in your intuitive knowing of something. So that's what this painting was. And, and this is kind of where my head was before the pandemic really took a hold of me in my studio. Mm. So then Heather, with that long of a title, what were you mapping? Oh, like, uh, what was I mapping? I was mapping, um, I was using an old map called How to Fold My Heart. And I did a whole series of work where I indexed the people I love in my life and then looked at all the places that they were, that they lived, where they were born and died. And so this one needed to be updated because I hadn't done it since my son was born. And so I had to include him in my map. And so I changed my map and then did this painting based on that new mapping of my own life. So nice. So at some point it changed. Awesome. And then where the, um, where the white is now, the pattern, had you put just from a techno, like um, a technique type, did you put any tape down for those lines or you just drew it in pencil and then ended up, you know, painting from there? Um, yes, I, I do. I use a pencil and, and a protractor and do it and just make my lines first. Then I paint the lines and then I do, then I draw the outside lines again. And then I paint the lines again, maybe two or three times, uh, in thin coats. And sometimes I leave a little transparency and sometimes I don't. Uh, and, and then the final bit would be to go back with the lines again. Mm -hmm. uh, on the outside. So I'm kind of using a very small brush to paint in between, you know, I, I think of it as all the marks in between the empty bits I'm trying not to touch. Yes. I don't like paint one line and go like this. That do it doesn't happen that way. I, I paint the outside of the line and the inside of the line and then I, on either side and then I fill in in the center because mm -hmm. I'm not very neat and tidy. And then I, and of course I swap all over the place. So then I have to go back and scrape it out and tidy it up and you know, do all that. I tried the taping off thing. There's another painting down at the end of the gallery. I can show you where I tried that. Effects. Um, but I really like painting stripes. It's very meditative. It's, it's kind of hard for me to do. And so I, I, I tend to gravitate towards things that are very simple and hard to achieve and require a lot of dedication. It, <laughs> say that's probably right. <laughs> Um, what else can I show you over here in this area? Let me finish off this area. There's two other works that are from this time. One here on this side um, is called Light Through the Trees. And it's a four panel work that looks at four plots in a forest that Duke Forest Archives had cataloged for luminosity. So I was working on a project at the Rubenstein uh, Center for, for the Arts at Duke University on a residency and I went into their archives and was looking interested in forestry data because it's a hundred years of forestry data that's all been handwritten by people going out into the forest with equipment 
and writing it down uh, on the backs of, of just whatever kind of scrap paper and then putting it in a folder. And they did it for a hundred years and they just sat there. Uh, so I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went to go look and I spent weeks and weeks just digging in the archives to see what's there. And the luminosity data was very interesting because they had a real method for taking the data and um, that talked about placing the thermopile in the middle of the plot and turning it clockwise um, at a certain time interval and, and taking these four different measurements and then they mark them all down. And so when I took these four plots and I took their little bits of data and I put them all together, it ended up making a really large tree ring, which was not at all planned in the slightest. The data did it. And what's interesting is that all four of these plots come from adjacent adjacent land, which, you know, that just seems kind of mind boggling to me uh, that, that the data would do that, but it is kind of beautiful kind of tracing of, of um, light in the empty spaces. The thing that you, the, the intent level of intensity of the thing, which is unseen. And, um, and then also around this time I was, I did this piece, which is called a signal from Ganymede. And I'm, it has these concentric circles here inside and uh, these circles talk about the resonates between um, uh, Europa, Io, and Ganymede. You know, uh, there's one orbit for, gosh, I can't remember which one is which. I think it's Io that's closest in. And then it takes twice as long for Ganymede. And then, oh, wait, no, that's Europa. And then twice, and then four times the length. Exactly, right? So it's a one, two, four for these three Jupiter moons which is quite interesting. And the painting in the background is based on a landscape photograph from a satellite that we sent, a space probe, uh, taking landscape photographs of Ganymede and, and it looks very familiar. So these mm -hmm. places that we imagine in our futures that are so far away, either you know, in our minds through time or in place, you know, uh, uh, light years away, they, they have a certain familiarity to them. And, and they have a certain sound and a resonance to them that I find so, um, so attractive. And um, I, 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 you, cause you find it everywhere. Of course, once you start looking for something you find it everywhere, which, you know, that's just kind of the bane of our existence, I suppose. Um, so this is, these works I've shown you was definitely where I was thinking at the time, you know, larger, er, or larger ideas of complexity and experience. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and none of us could see each other. And I really missed um, handshakes and touching people. So the last thing you'll see in this area of the gallery is the handshake project. And um, if you could show the, I don't know if the video will show or not very yeah. well. Um, so I'm gonna get in so as you can see how big this is. So this is submitted handshakes. This particular video is a clip from another artist called, um, Alyssa Miserandino, and she's done some amazing work with sound, but also was very generous to, to photograph a bunch of handshakes in her backyard for me. Mm. And so we have this, this product here to show in the gallery. And what I've been trying to do is get people to volunteer here to create handshakes here in the gallery. So we, we set up a little video place where people can do that. And then also many people have been sending me handshake videos um, through email which I can then put all together and make a longer handshake video of people um, touching each other all through the pandemic. And you'll see lots of secret handshakes in here, a lot of fist bumping. Um, some of the ones I've recently gotten have dogs and cats in them, uh, <laughs> or they're just all children. Um, people, people just shaking hands, mostly the ones I've gotten through the pandemic are all pod mates. You know, but now I, I can see that maybe we can get people who aren't necessarily pod mates to be able to shake hands again. And that's a, a really wonderful and hopeful time that we're in now. And I'm so pleased um, that we've gotten there. So this is kind of an ongoing project. And there's some ideas about where it might live in the world as it, as it progresses. I imagine I'll just keep doing that I love for a while. That. And then we're gonna move into the main event. Um, I don't really know how to talk about these things. Um, 
how should we do this? Should we talk about the, the COVID drawings first or should we talk about the large installations? First? I think what maybe since we're right here and we're looking at the installation, why don't we do that? Because I feel like it would be a little bit of a tease otherwise. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> um, so in the, in the background here is a piece called No Justice, No Peace. Mm -hmm. And it is a, or it's based on an origami pattern um, by, of that quote. So all of the text is converted to ASCII values, which then give me numbers that I can put into the length measurements for each one of the facet edges. Um, and then I, and I can make it the full 97, this is 97 uh, feet long, and it's all done in one inch black tape and purple, purple masking tape. And uh, over here, you can see, um, the diagram for it, you know, uh, a lot of times people want to know exactly how how these things actually get on the wall, you know, because it, well, it's and and that's a great question, and I've had that question a lot. How exactly am I going to do this? And so, how I figured it out best to handle it is to just do a do a scale drawing, and then I kind of show myself which way my my tape is going to go, um, because I often work with an assistant in order to do the taping, because otherwise it would just take forever, you know? Uh, so each one of the measurements, uh, each one of the intersections where the angles come together, you can see that I've written, I've written the measurement of the angle there. And so when I get up to draw it on the wall, I'm able to use a protractor and a laser level to get these angles correct and draw the line. And to start it all off, I have to find, of course, you gotta know where you're gonna put your very first mark. And so in every one of these has what I would call a true north. And that is a, that is a point that's determined um, by the architecture of the place, really. So I knew where I wanted it to end, which in this case would be where I start. Uh, so I knew I wanted to start here at this top corner. So I even marked it true north. And so this is the very first mark I would have placed on the wall and then I would have measured everything, all of these angles uh, correctly and I check them as I'm going along and then I, when I'm done, I, I reach to the end, I should end up somewhere where I think I'm going to. And in this case, I did, which was, which was good. I was a few feet off of what I thought it would be, uh, which is great. And then as you proceed through this thing, you know, you have to deal with, you know, going around the architecture of the thing of putting it on the door, cutting around, you know, labels or, um, you know, the, the ventilation control systems for the place. Um, it's kind of a wonderful way of getting to know the, the walls of a place, especially a place that's been around and showing art as long as Green Hill has. You can see the remainders of every show that has ever been in here before, because I am, I am touching literally every square inch of this because I'm putting tape on. Um, it's a wonderful way to get to know a space. Um, and so every now and again, I come in here and I kind of got to put the tape down. Um, like this one here, you can see like it starts curling. See, it's just tape, just tape. And the whole thing, took um, a few, I said, it took about a week to get it completely done. And when it's, when it's all over, uh, I can tear it off the wall in an hour and compress it down into a, probably a, a tape ball about this big. And I typically like to kick it around the gallery for a little while. It's a very fun to do. And then in the center- Heather, the please, stick, when you do that, take a picture of the giant ball and then like a video of you kicking it around. We'll share it, we'll okay. share it. That would be fun. Okay. I will do that. And then in the center of the space, uh, we've got this, the four columns. And this piece is called Essential Worker. Mm. And when I first came to the space to, to really go over it with, uh, with Edie and, and think about you know, how, to, how to really activate all of this empty space. And of course, keep it empty because it's the time of COVID, right? So if anybody was going to come, we didn't want to fill up the space too much. So really had to think a lot about through lines. And uh, Edie pointed out that, you know, that, that these columns had really rarely been used for exhibition space. And they are part of, the, of what this space was before, which was the, uh, the news and records. So there were large printing presses in here for the newspaper. And I thought um, 
that the columns are right in the center of the space holding everything up, but relatively invisible. You know, they're, they're essential to, the, to maintaining structural integrity and yet um, largely ignored. So I thought, well, let's, let's just do something really obvious. Let's make, them, let's make them stick out so nobody could miss them. And so I thought, well, essential workers seems like the perfect, uh, that seems perfect. Because at the time I was doing this, I was so, and I know many of us are, had this experience of going to the grocery store and, and being concerned for people that work there or people that are delivering us things or our doctors for crying out, doctors and nurses, you know, like we couldn't have gone through COVID without them. And I got to stay home and safe a lot and not put my, my family in harm's way because other people were doing that. And, um, and so this is kind of uh, my thank you for that. And uh, I chose to wrap them in gold. Uh, to, to uh, bring as much value to, to all the labor that was done, that wasn't, and is still being done, that's relatively unseen. And um, I suppose that's all I really want to say about that. I'm probably missing lots of things. And then there's one other tape, there's one other tape installation that's in the back. Do you want to see that? And then we can come back to some of these other elements? Yeah, that sounds great. Heather, while you're walking, um, I know we had many chats on your drives um, back and forth when you were coming to do the taping. Talk a little bit about, you know, how long it took, how you kind of um, divided up the process of making the installation. Oh, um, well, um, each one is a little different, you know, they all have their own so the, uh, the, the big 90 footer was the easiest of all, by far. And because it's, you know, it's one straight shot and it's all drywall. I mean, that's easy. Um, it, it's not something like the columns. They're, they're, they're not all the same size. They look like the same. Heather, we're losing the building. Each one, each, one the faces, each one is different. And when you talk What's that? We're we're losing you just a little bit with the um. I, I don't think it's mine. Is every is anybody okay. else having a hard time with uh, seeing her? Is that yes. part of the gallery? Yeah, yeah she's back. breaking up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You were great okay. before. So yeah. So um. So with the, with the big piece, it was fairly straightforward, and 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 uh, everything was as expected, right? With the columns, though, each one was different, and I didn't quite know how to do it. You know, you can put something on a piece of paper and think it's just going to wrap around something. Like, you know, that's a nice thought. Uh, in reality, it doesn't really work that way. And these also have these strange, uh, these areas where there's, there's a kind of a cutout on the corner. Um, and then, you know, here, there's not, the, the design isn't wrapping, but uh, over here, it is wrapping. And when you wrap a straight line over one little cutout area, it does all kinds of very unpleasant things. Um, so I had to take out a lot of tape uh, on these and I did one column at a time. That way we could kind of spread it out over time and I uh, could be visible in the gallery doing the work, uh, which was really wonderful because I think most of the time people did not realize that I was the artist. <laughs> and so I got to hear what they really thought. Um, and it was all really nice and wonderful. Nobody said anything awful. So I felt kind of that, that was, that was good, but it's nice to hear what would be a fly on the wall, so to speak, standing here with a bunch of tape and, and it's amazing. And, and sometimes people didn't even see me at all. And I'm working on essential worker. Oh my God. It, it's just like, so ironic. I can't stand it. It's so funny. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> So there's one other piece called the central worker while we're on this topic. And that's this one here. This is, a, this is an oil painting on canvas, it's 36 inches square. And it has 19 different layers in it where I've manipulated the pattern and flipped it backwards and forwards and redrawn it and, and repainted it multiple times over trying to create um, veils of 
translucency to indicate that this is the net of people. It's not any one person, although we could certainly point to a news story about amazing heroic deeds. But essentially, essential workers are a bunch of people getting up every day and doing the, the work that needs to be done and not really saying a whole lot about it. They're just doing it every day. And that kind of dedication um, with other people being dedicated and thoughtful and careful is really um, a marvelous, a marvelous thing about human beings. It's something I've really held on to a lot during this time. That's about all I want to say about that. Um, <laughs> how, about, how, about, how about some other things? Uh, how about this big purple? Well, let's thing? talk about this one because this one, when I saw it, um, when you were just finishing it up, it just kind of like blew me away. So yeah, like, was this the last piece that you made for the exhibit, Heather? Um, it was, I, I believe it was, yeah, it was near the end. Yeah, right. I, I think probably I started, it was one of the first ones I started, but one of the last ones I finished, probably because I just don't like it very much. Oh, um, it's very, I love perfect. it. I think I it's it super, super sexy and great in person. It's, I love it's it. It's very purple. <laughs> It's like, a, you know, and I was thinking, I was thinking that I tried many different colors, you know, because what is the color of protest? What feels right? Um, and, I, and I tried lots of colors, but they didn't feel right. They didn't have the right kind of resonance. They didn't, you know, like when you stand in front of these, they're so large, they, they take up the entirety of your, your eye space. And uh, it didn't have the right, um, the right sound. So there's a lot of fluorescent colors in here, a lot of fluorescent uh, neon reds and, and pinks and magentas. There's iridescent colors. Um, there are interference colors that so that when you change your angle or the light changes angle, you get a different painting. Uh, because of the fluorescent colors, this thing can look very different in the morning as opposed to it looks very blue in the morning and very kind of red and warm in the evenings. It's like having two paintings in one. It's kind of a it's kind of a wonderful thing that fluorescent colors do that I've really enjoyed because a lot of the paintings in the show use fluorescent colors a great deal, and and I think I was thinking about the the synthetic quality of color. You know, we say oh a neon color that's not you know we we think that's so artificial, but it's not artificial. It's natural to the world. Many things that we don't encounter a lot are natural to the world. It doesn't make them synthetic. They're just maybe something we don't experience a lot. So I started mixing with colors and started thinking about what would it be like to be go to a painting show if I was a dragonfly? You know, a dragonfly can see so much more of the spectrum, color spectrum, than we can. And so I started thinking when I was working with interference colors and fluorescent colors, you know, that I was making paintings that dragonflies might enjoy which made me think that maybe if I was partially successful, which of course I wouldn't know because I'm not a dragonfly, it at least I could produce something that might be, it might give people a reason to come down to the space during this time when people don't want to leave their homes. Um, and, and so I kind of hope that these paintings, they warrant being in the space with them physically and having a physical proximity to the works, which is something that's been lost you know, during this time, you know, I mean, I know I haven't gone to as many shows because of COVID. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to do something, something different, I guess, was, was the idea. Uh, what, what else can I show you? How about, how about this one? These, uh, these, these things are called part of a project called How Do You Feel? And they're 48 by 72 inches, roughly speaking. And they are responses uh, from, from people as it, to that question, how do you feel? And uh, right now, you can see how many responses are up on the wall for how do you feel. And each one of these, I will take and um, uh, translate them into, um, into uh, wh what's the word, I'm, into number content, right? I'm gonna do ask you value, uh, equivalents for them, and then I come up with with a pattern. So people can fill out the thing, and then you know they, they stick stick it in the slot. A lot of people choose the purple more than they choose the gold. What's up with that? It's real interesting. I did that with a purpose. 
And I noticed that people always put into the purple and very rarely into the gold. Do they think they're not worth the gold? I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, have you swapped the, the placement too? Like, have you had them on the opposite side? Great idea. There you go. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. I hadn't thought that. Okay. Yeah. So each, buddy, so each one of these responses then turns into a taped piece so that then um, a lot of so these movable walls can have artwork on it that's created in collaboration with someone saying how they feel. And I like that idea, you know, this one here is the latest one is, um, it's from Marsha Woodward. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. She's from Greensboro. Um, here we go, here we go, here we go. And her response was that she feels hopeful, weary, and sad. And so I took each one of those letters and made, made a pattern for it. And here's the shape of her emotion. So then, Heather, you've been doing these throughout the exhibit. I have uh, more or less. I mean, I, I'm kind of getting into the season of doing this. I've got another month left in, in the show run, and I'm going to be focusing my attention on this. The essential worker columns took a long time to achieve. Um, and so that, that really did suck up a lot of time. And now our recent gas crisis sucked up three days that I would have had here doing this work, but uh, you know, we float, we just kind of roll with that stuff, right? We, we roll with it. Heather, when you were getting, um, when we were losing you because of reception, I don't know if you started to talk about your, um, your piece that was a response to another piece. Um, yes. Had you, had you started to talk about it and we just couldn't hear it or did we not? Yes. Exactly. Let's try you standing over here and then angling in towards the thing. What do you think? Because you've got like a Wi-Fi box right there, I notice. Or some, some, something, some such thing is looking very networky. Okay, how's your reception? Great, we got okay. you. So here in the back of the, this glass wall here that faces outward to the street is, is a piece called One Love Response. And on the street outside, is a is a um, I am completely blanking on the artist's name and I'm Philip Marsh. Philip Marsh. Philip Marsh. Yeah, Philip Marsh. Thank you. Thank you. Had made a um, a mural on the street outside that says "One Love." And when I came to visit and meet with Edie the first time, I walked past that piece, and it made me feel um, like I was in the right place at the right time. It. Uh, it felt welcoming. So I, I thought that the very first thing I could do would be to say thank you or um, to be responsive in some way. So that's why I call it One Love Response. So I took the words, One Love, um, it's from the Bob Marley song. That was the, the reference that Philip used. And so I converted that into a pattern that says One Love and put it in red vinyl tape out here and uh, it faces the park, which is heavily used by myself and many other people. And people walk up and down this street all the time. In the afternoon, the light comes streaming in here and um, it makes these beautiful uh, 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 shadows, linear shadows all over the wall, uh, all over the floor here, which is quite beautiful. I think there's something people in right now. Now this piece becomes, um, like selfie, this is like the selfie place for yeah. this street. I cannot tell you how many times I was sitting here working and seeing people taking selfies right there in front of the art. Um, you know, I hope they're crediting me. Uh, I, I don't know if they are, they are not, uh, but it is really great to see people engaging with the work outside of the gallery space. And then hopefully looking through the windows into what, what else is involved in, you know, what else is here that they could come in. It's a way of opening the doors that I was just continuing from Philip's work. And then everything else in, in this room is all fluorescent. They're all done with fluorescent paints. So this room in the afternoon becomes very, very bright and well lit. I mean, this is the happy talk room. This is the room where everything can become synthetic. 
Um, you know, like what's real and what isn't? I don't know. I don't know. Heather, the and there's some companion pieces in here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This one. I, I was going to ask one about one? the red one, the, but the talk red about one. that one. Which one? The red one. The red one. Okay. You talking about the red one? This one's called Happy Talk. This is the third one of the. This is the last. This is the first large painting, but the last of the three Happy Talk pieces that I made. Um, and and uh, I don't know really what's to say about it. The background was from a photograph that my son took when he was four years old of his toys on his, on his floor. And so it's just kind of like a strange kind of um, gradated atmospheric background out of like the view of a child of reality, blurry and in motion. And then, then it's just covered over with this, with these very harsh and delineated hard edge, the reality of what happy talk is over the top of it, kind of holding it all together and giving things structure. Um, I really like this painting a lot. This one, this one literally hurt me to bake. Uh, it was in my studio and I have a pretty large studio. And when in the afternoon, I, it's hard to be in there because the light would come in and everything in the studio would be red. And when I come out of the studio, everything is like cyan, you know, like you get the opposite color of that you've been staring at. So I, uh, I can work on this as often as I would like to work because I, your eyes screwed up in painting with these colors that you, you can't really see the color right on your, on Heather, your palette anymore. You, you have to go to away the other room? and then come back. Heather, can we yeah. move you back in? Thank you. I don't want to miss anything you're saying. Thanks. Okay. There you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. So that's pretty much the show. I mean, I could go on ad finitum. Well, wait a minute. We haven't talked about the COVID drawings. Holy no. smokes. Let's go back and do that. Because that's the most fun, right? Mm -hmm. I think. Show I mean, us. They're not, they're not the most pleasant. Uh, okay. So there's four of these. And I was looking at the news and um, really having a hard time understanding what to believe. And this was at the very beginning. This is the very first thing that was done for this show. And I wasn't, wasn't even sure that it was gonna be for the show. I just needed to, um, I needed to blow some stuff out first before I could start, a, start to think cohesively about this thing because I was emotionally upset. So this is Trump's response initial response to COVID about it going to go away and, um, you know, there's only one person in suit and soon it'll be zero. Uh, and I really had a hard time with that happy talk and I felt like he was lying and I don't like lies. I really have a hard time with lies. Um, but at the same time, I also have a hard time with complicity. Uh, I have a hard time with sitting around and knowing something doesn't feel right being able to point to the facts of why something isn't right and then doing nothing about it. And so the second, so the, there's three texts here that are compared. So the first is just Trump's response to COVID and it's all in ASCII values. See, and then we get these binary equivalents where you see the blacks are where the ones would be for the, for the binary equivalent of the letter that's in the text. And that's done all throughout. And, and then the second text is from Lord of the Flies. And it's a passage that talks about, um, you know, where power is, is, you can see that power is becoming solidified in a tyrant's hands, but mostly because everyone else is afraid. They're afraid of a possible future. And so they give themselves over to what they suspect is poor leadership but because their fear is more overwhelming. And so that's, that's a passage that's in here. And then the last line, the last passage is from Montaigne who uh, wrote this essay called On Liars. And he is a Renaissance philosopher. And, and he thinks that liars should be punished in the most harshest of ways. <laughs> so I, I like <laughs> his thinking. Uh, so that was the first one. And it's called Mentiri, which is uh, Latin for, um, lies, essentially. 
And then we move on to just essentially what you see is four drawings of me getting upset about stuff in the news. That's, that's really what it is. So this one is, it is what it is. And at the top, it has Michelle Obama's DNC speech where <laughs> I, I had like such a moment with that. Um, she was at the Democratic convention and many of you may have watched her speech. And at the very end of it, she takes a dig at Trump who was asked, and I have his interview down here, he was interviewed with Axios and Jonathan Swan asked how the virus is under control. How could Trump say that the virus is under control when a thousand Americans are dying each day? And Trump's response is, it is what it is. That's the response. And uh, so at the end of Michelle Obama's speech, she talks about how Trump is not the man for us. It is what it is. And I just, I love that so much. I laughed, I cried, and I documented it. Heather, I think I was actually with you the day after that speech. So this must have been like just starting in your mind because you were so excited about that speech. Oh, I was. Boy, she made it. She's a badass. Yeah. She said all the things that I wish I could have said with no emotion and lots of eloquence. (laughs) Oh, Oh my God. It was such a real moment. Uh, and then to celebrate more women saying wonderful things, um, I, we had this, this one uh, called Bush League. And this is, this is more of a, uh, a thing about women, not about the President Bush. This is, you know, think a little bit more crudely. Uh, and you'll understand the reference to Bush League. So Joseph Epstein had, or Epstein, had written this Wall Street Journal opinion on December 11th, 2020, and called... Um, Jill Biden, kiddo, are you ready for that? <laughs> kiddo, uh, and encouraged her to not call herself doctor um, unless she had delivered a baby. I'm like, okay, all right. Uh, and so there's this long rambling thing. She also incidentally calls it rather Bush League to, uh, to call yourself doctor. So uh, then uh, below, below his lovely words, I've put Jill Biden's response. I've put Michelle Obama's response. I've put Hillary Clinton's response, which was my favorite. Her response was, her name is Dr. Jill Biden. Get used to it. <laughs> uh, and then the, then, then the final quote, I had to add in Missy Elliott. Uh, it took us a lot of hard work to get here. So all that hate and animosity between folks, y'all need to kill it with a skillet. And so, <laughs> that's which many women are, are familiar with, become reacquainted with in this pandemic years. I know I have, you can't make good cornbread without one of those. <laughs> and then the last one is Sunshine Enema. And uh, we all remember our president, our, our previous president, suggesting that disinfectant or strong light entering into the body would somehow rid us of this this vile disease. And so I've put you know, his, his thoughts about disinfectant to treat coronavirus, along with the uh, company's statement from Lysol talking <laughs> about the improper use of its disinfectant and don't ever use our products internally. And I called it sunshine enema because really, I mean, I'm not sticking that inside me. It, it seems like more happy talk. And then, I have this video here mm-hmm. that I shot on inauguration day. This was shot in my backyard on the day that um, uh, Joe Biden gave his acceptance speech. And he said, um, my whole soul is in this. And I burst into tears. I mean, I mean, he said that and I believed my president for the first time in years. And it was a real moment for me. And I, I don't know how many other people felt it. I was alone by myself, uh, not able to share it with other people. Um, so this is me sharing what my backyard looked like on that day. A kind of palate cleanser for all of this that happened beforehand. And when, incidentally, we just had the, uh, the anniversary of the sunshine Enema disinfectant statement um, that happened in April 23rd of last year. So that wasn't too far ago. Yeah. Okay, now that is truly it. Oh, 
Heather, I love this so much. Thank you for walking us all around. And I totally monopolized all the time in questions. Does anybody else want to say anything or ask any questions? Thank you for doing this. The works are amazing. Your energy is incredible. So thank you for sharing your personal stories with when you're talking about your artwork. That was great. And I really love the COVID drawings. <laughs> thank you. Heather, you might want to mention your, your video at the entrance to the gallery. Oh, yeah, right. That's a good idea. Um, so all during this time, we, uh, as we're watching the news, you know, we see, um, we see uh, trans translations for deaf people. And um, let's see if I can get this to flip around here. There we go. And so I thought, well, let's have a welcome right at the beginning. So when you come into the gallery, you can see this video piece uh, and it's me signing. Um, what, what do I say? I say shift, shift happens at Green Hill um, by Heather, no, shift happens by Heather Gordon at Green Hills, uh, welcome, something, something like that. And I can't remember exactly now. I did this so many times in one night and you think I'd remember forever. I thought it was uh, welcome. Yeah, it ends with welcome. Yes, it was kind of a, a way of, of showing this beautiful language. Uh, and in fact, I've become so in, enamored with how beautiful this language is that I've signed up for a course to learn more about deaf culture and, and also just to learn how to sign because, I mean, it's just a gorgeous language. Yeah. And you can see Heather, outside. Heather, here's the piece I bought from you uh, when you're uh, several years ago. Oh, which book did you get? Lady Chatterley's Lover. Oh. I love this piece. I've always loved it. So thank you very much. It's an excellent show, and I love this piece. Thank you. Thank you. Lizzie, can I just add one little note? Um, I just wanted to share. Add as much as you can. Please. I just want to share with everyone that uh, we have a beautiful, professional, very comprehensive catalog of all of the works in, in this exhibition. Um, there's great writing in this catalog and, um, you know, dimensions. And uh, so I really encourage you. Um, it's very easily accessible. I mean, literally, you just type in Green Hill, you'll get it's right on our homepage. It comes up right away. And it's just a wonder, wonderful way to linger with some of these words. Yes, it's so true. And the writing is exceptional. And also, I know I'm going to be requesting one to be sent to me in Seattle, but y'all made a great t-shirt. I have, so I don't really wear t-shirts and the only t-shirts that I own are ones that Heather has made. And now this one too, Heather made me another shirt a little while ago that I, that oh. I wear all the time. And now I need this <laughs> one. one. So do you have it one. nearby that they can see or? Oh, wait, I, I think I have to like, I, Heather can, is the shop, oh, can you get into the shop? It's not open. Oh, <laughs> shoot. Wait, 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 we have to make this happen. Is Janae still there? Um, I'm sure someone's around. It looks like it's just me. <laughs> Everybody left. You break in. Oh, oh, here she oh. comes. Hey, can you show us the shirt? Oh, here, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yay. We're so, we're so excited. It's, we, it's a limited edition. We only made 20. It was, it's an original tape design by Heather. Um, it was printed locally. And so, you know, lots of love and care went into this. And yes. um, we have just a few in this. And it comes with a certificate, you know, that of authenticity that says it's, you know, four of 20. And, um, and we have it on a mannequin in our right. shop. How do we get the lights on? How do um, we get the lights on in here? Here we go. It's very dark in here. <laughs> and it's, is it gray? Because uh, it's, it's dark. Gray, yeah. It's like a dark, it's a dark gray. It's a dark gray shirt. And I made the template using tape. So then he was able to expose the screen using the original piece of art. Can you take it out into the gallery where there's light? Yeah. You know what? We're locked in the shop oh. now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck. Back in the gallery. <laughs> Okay, 10 seconds. Wait a minute. Here we go. And then turn, turn now around. You have more light. Oh, look. Look at it. Look, look at here. Here's a, this one's more. Oh, look here we go. Oh, okay. Go around and show the back of the shirt because it's very subtle. 
but on the back of the shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Says, Look at shift, that. It's awesome. It happens. When um, Barbara and I were on the phone, I guess it was last week, you were telling me about how y'all had some, your daughter was helping with, yes. with some, yeah. Yes, we did a focus group in London um, just to make, you know, on the placement and the size and, you know. Um, <laughs> Very international shirt. <laughs> yeah, and so it is It is seen on the streets in London at the moment and it's become very popular. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I have always had a, a love of museum shirts, t-shirts. I have collected them for years. And so when this idea happened, I was like, are you kidding me? My own museum yeah. shirt with my own shit on it? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was so tempted. I love the title shift happened so much. Um, but I, I, you know, we toyed with the idea of having that on the front, but no, I think, you know, just having the art on the front and it's just very subtle on the back. It just adds that extra. And it's, she's actually mapped the words, Heather mapped shift happens. So that's the design. Yeah. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'll get one and it'll be in Seattle. And then yes. mom, yes. you can get one and it'll be in California. So Heather, you'll be all over. Yeah. By so. coastal. <laughs> and across the Atlantic. I know. Yay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Any other questions or Heather, you want to say anything else before we log off? Thank you. How about that? I'd like to say thank you to, to everyone that's been, you know, the, dealing with me during this show. This has been a year we've been doing this. So, you know, the staff, and the people that work here at Green Hill have just been flexible and attentive and responsive and all the things while, you know, dealing with their own personal lives and not being sure how, what the, what the future is here. And, and you know, it's been, uh, it's been difficult and, and, and um, they've just been really fantastic and people have been showing up for the show and, and coming to these virtual things and, and, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank, thank you, you, Lizzie. Of course. It was just an honor. I'm so thrilled I got to see it. I'm sorry it wasn't in person, but this was wonderful to get to do this too. <laughs>